So obviously I work for Diageo. Uh, you may not know the company, but I'm sure you know the brands up there. Um, and the role I play in Diageo is I um, run what we call a supply chain center of excellence. So we've, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but we've um, changed our, our uh, organization model to a, a 21 market model. So we've gone from quite a, um, a, uh, a global, regional, and functional model through into very small center and then markets that have got um, total uh, uh, um, responsibility for their own P&L and everything that goes around that to make it happen. So what we've done is we've set up center of excellence then for, I look after with a supply chain that support those markets, uh, set strategies, support the markets, uh, create initiatives, provide resource and support um, when, when it's deemed necessary. So that's what we do. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is the role of supply chain within what is actually a, um, a kind of marketing and brand-led organization and how supply chain is actually supporting and driving in many instances uh, the growth of the Diageo. Okay, some stats on the scale of the, uh, uh, the supply chain that we've got in Diageo. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty large uh, with significant spend. Uh, Diageo is the largest um, alcoholic drinks company by NSV uh, in the world. And you'll see there reference to a company called USL, which is United Spirits Limited, which we've acquired in India, which we're now in the process of integrating, which is the largest alcoholics drinks business by volume. So it's a kind of a big organization, big supply chain. And therefore, you can see all of a sudden, you know, when you start thinking about that, and it wasn't always this way, that uh, what happens in supply chain can have a very significant impact on what happens to the performance of the company. Okay. Um, we have a, an ambition set out by a new CEO about two years ago. Uh, and what he's also done is he's adjusted uh, sort of the areas of focus. These blue things here and gray, they're what we call a must do's, right? So that drives everything that uh, actually happens in the company. These are the things, the strategic imperatives that drive what happened in the company. And if you look at them hard enough, you'll see there's a lot of stuff in there that is supply chain related, whether it's cost, uh, whether it's innovation, or whether it's uh, building a and changing our route to consumer. One of the big things we're talking about is how do we get better to consumers with our products, okay? Um, we think about supply chain in Diageo along the standard plant source, make, move. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you would um, similarly uh, structure supply chains that way along those process lines. And we've got a bunch of themes and programs that help drive efficiency and improvement in those elements of supply chain. And what I'll do is I'll talk about a few of them. So you can get to see what we do and maybe you'll see and hopefully maybe get some ideas for yourselves uh, what you might actually do in your supply chains to drive the performance of your business. Okay, so start with demand driven. The issue is a demand driven organization. So everything starts with what is the demand from the consumer we work back from there. <coughs> uh, and within our supply chain, we've done a number of things to try and affect that. Um, Route to consumer, which I, which I touched on, uh, through um, some analysis that we've done, we realize that we don't reach actually a lot of our consumers. In some markets you can't, because you've got to sell through distributors in the US because that's the way it works. But in other markets, you know, we go to distributors and the actual consumer, we've got no contact with at all. So we've done a lot of work, uh, supply chain, with the sales team, looking at <coughs> how do we set ourselves up better um, in that whole root consumer. So for the sales guys, it's meant a huge change in terms of how they do their work. For supply chain, it's meant major, major changes in terms of our, our distribution networks in many markets across the world. Um, and the result of that is it has grown significant NSV so that when you can actually get to a consumer, rather than being uh, uh, back from a consumer, uh, then you will obviously be able to influence them more and they might start taking your products more. Once and for all, about two years ago, we said we've got to sort out this SNOP. Every conference I've been going to for years is, oh, how do you get SNOP in and this, that, and all the other. Um, and, um, you know, we've talked about it for years. We've tried it in Diageo many, many times. So on this occasion, it was definitely executive-led. It won't work otherwise. We've all heard that before. We put a standard process in place. We measure now how effective those 21 markets are 
through measures that we put in with their supply chain, uh, sorry, with their SNOP. Um, and that's a very significant measure on the balance scorecard of that market. So you can talk about it and all the rest of it, you've actually got to do it. And that's kind of what we did over the last year and a half. And it works really well now, in fact, um, linking up the whole supply and demand plans. <coughs> and demand plans. Um, one of the things that was causing, I don't know if your markets have got this, or your companies have got this issue, um, we have a lot of peaks. Now, some of them are real, and uh, some of them are less real. And it causes a huge amount of inefficiency, both in terms of cost and also in cash inefficiency. Uh, so we've looked at how could we smooth those peaks. That was not an easy thing. We haven't cracked it at all. But in a, in a bunch of markets, again, working with the, um, the, uh, the sales guys particularly, looking at what are the trade terms that we have, you know, um, uh, what are the... Um, uh, the way in which we place orders and all that sort of stuff. So we've set up now with many markets <coughs> a, a big change in terms of this peak, which has meant that we've had to look at from that customer demand what trade terms we should be providing to the uh, custom, uh, customers and then moving back right through the organization in terms of how we plan our supply chain to deliver against that. So there are some of the things that we did in market driven. Cost. Um, I said that, that uh, it's a pretty large organisation, the supply side of uh, Diageo. We spend uh, just about £6 billion on uh, supply-related stuff. Uh, so again, if you uh, move on that, you can make a big change. You know, on um, our logistics and warehousing alone, uh, we spend about £650 million. So that was a completely and utterly disregarded part of our supply chain for many years. It was contracted out, didn't care about it. Uh, somebody else did it. I'm exaggerating slightly, but it wasn't too far off that. Um, Realisation, particularly through our route to consumer and how we grow our business, that this end of our supply chain is one that we really need to start thinking about. Diageo isn't um, unusual in that now. A lot of other people are realising that you know manufacturing is kind of sorted. Most of the plants are running at as high an OE as they possibly could. Everybody's got planning systems like APO. What about this bit at the end that faces up to the customer? Um, that actually can be quite uh, a big cost element of your business as well. So we set up a program about a year ago, a uh, year and a half ago now. It was cost driven, I must say, uh, where we looked to take uh, 60 million out of the cost base in, um, in three years. There was no science there, it was just 10%. Um, and last year we took 33 out, this year it's going to be 25, and then whatever's left out of 60 after that. But it's done a bit more than that as well. It's kind of created the. Um, awareness of what um, logistics and warehousing can offer for a business. Uh, not just cost, of course, but we've also now looked <coughs> and <coughs> established quite a, a, um, a, a significant um, a what we call move capability program so that the gains that we've got can be sustained and, of course, we set ourselves up for a platform for future improvement in that, uh, in that area. So that could be an area in your um, organisations that you might want to... Um, to think about procurement. Um, procurement was a little bit uh, uh, mixed in terms of how it was structured. Again, two years ago, we totally centralised our procurement. Uh, unlike the markets, <laughs> which all went, uh, procurement was one area that was centralised, <coughs> and it's kind of a rule of thumb, which um, was that eighty percent of our procurement spend would be. Um, will be centrally driven, okay? You can get all sorts of tax b uh, benefits from that as well, depending on where you set up your, your procurement organisation. Uh, and that's another benefit, which, uh, which if you look into it, you can get. The benefit that we have seen is that through the leveraging of scale, uh, we um, targeted and got uh, 100 million savings uh, last year, and the target for this year is a similar amount. Finally, around cost, we've been very aggressive on our footprint. Um, and um, investing in technology that will set us up and future-proof us for uh, years to come. So for a little example of that would be, say, in the UK, Ireland, we had six breweries, and now we've got one uh, in Dublin that, pr that produces all that six did in the past. And you can do that through, I guess, being bold enough, aggressive enough, and investing enough to um, um, make sure you get the technologies that will, that will deliver something in a robust way.